Hi, today I'm with Will Ramey from Penny and Associates Personal Injury Attorneys. And the question of today is, can a personal injury lawsuit be for mental injuries? Um, absolutely, and, and one of the common ways that we refer to those are psychological injuries or emotional injuries. And general damages, which is a big part of what we recover for people, are a lot of times made up of intangible items and those intangible items. So there's kind of a start with every personal injury case. And it's assumed that uh, you're going to get that. The law provides that, that you're going to get the normal uh, damages for any type of emotional injury from being in an accident. But it can go on to a lot more than that and a lot more complicated. And I'm going to kind of divide it into what I would call purely um, – psychological injuries, and then traumatic brain injuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, the traumatic brain injuries are very new because the concussion uh, medical information that we have about uh, the effects of a concussion, how it can be long-term, the effects of repeated concussions, or if you get a concussion, if you used to play football, and then you get a concussion later on in life, how it can be much more debilitating. And so the medicine is kind of evolving on that, but that's a big part of several cases that I've worked on. Now those cases, because they're all subjective complaints, meaning I've got mental fogginess, I'm having trouble with my memory, um, I'm having uh, trouble focusing, uh, those type of things, there's always a little bit of a psychological component. And then uh, it's a, the you know, the, the good news is those injuries are completely recognized by the law. The hard part about those injuries is you have to come up with evidence and proof. And so it requires a lot of treatment and a lot of diagnostic treatment that can be a little bit more invasive. And then before you ask some follow-up, because I'm, I'm hoping that you will, uh, there's kind of the more, the pure psychological injury and the psychological injuries are uh, where it's, it's not a traumatic brain injury, but you've had emotional distress um, and you've got um, maybe some uh, traumatic stress disorder uh, that's going on with an accident. And a, the most common one that I've seen is people become afraid to drive. They've been driving a long time or they get into an accident at night on the freeway. Well, then they don't want to ride they don't want to drive at night and they don't want to drive on the freeway. Well, if you have a job or if you have a social life, which most of us have, that becomes a little bit problematic. And so then people go and seek treatment. And while that's common, uh, you know, again, it's the same kind of two, the good news is the law recognizes that damage. The difficult part is you have to come up with evidence and you have to make sure that you go and get treatment. It's really hard to say, well, I'm afraid of driving. And then, the, the common response is, well, then what have you done to make sure that you're not afraid of driving anymore? Did you go see a counselor? Did you go talk to anybody? Mm -hmm. So absolutely, personal injuries can be uh, mental in nature, both traumatic brain injury and what I would call kind of a pure psychological injury. That seems really challenging to prove because it seems like that could happen several years after an incident, right? Like, is there a time limit for that sort of thing? That's a really good question because sometimes the people don't realize how injured they are right. and will focus more on the traumatic brain injury. I think if there's a psychological injury, people recognize that they're anxious or that they can't drive and they recognize the need. That's pretty easy to recognize. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful and anxious when I'm in a car. Yeah. Now the cognitive issues uh, those cognitive issues can manifest themselves a lot later. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a similar difficulty we have with some of our other injuries, meaning you get a neck or a back injury and you've got something wrong with a disc, right? You go get an MRI, it takes a picture of that injury. Well, then the defense is always arguing, the insurance companies, well, how do we know they didn't have that before? And a lot of MRIs, especially anybody who's not, you know, who's older, I joke around with clients, anybody that's older than 20 years old, they're going to have an MRI and it's going to show degenerative changes, even if they have no back or neck pain. Uh, similar type issue here, 
except for in a cognitive one, it goes to neuropsychological testing. And that process is very invasive and intense and a little bit unpleasant. And you go meet with somebody who's just like I said, a neuropsychologist. And they do all of these tests that test your cognitive abilities and your executive function. And then they make some assumptions about your abilities pre-accident, meaning, okay, this person, uh, you know, had a degree and they worked as an accountant and they were really good about remembering numbers and now they can't remember them on this cognitive test. So I'm going to assume that that's a deficiency from the accident. But you can see, again, it's like the MRI picture with the degenerative changes. The insurance companies, the defense, they'll be saying, well, how do we know they weren't like that before? So there's a little bit of subjectivity to it. And the, the difficult part when I've handled cases like this with the neuropsych component is they, uh, we will hire someone to do the testing who's on our side. Uh, and... And then the other side will hire somebody the the insurance company will hire a doctor and they will come in and say, Oh no, this, they weren't injured at all from the accident. And so that's kind of demoralizing. Mm -hmm. And then it's difficult because that diagnostic, and I've talked to some practitioners about it saying, well, Hey, how often do you go and do the, this big battery of neuropsychological testing? And they're like, never, you know, they know somebody has an issue or a cognitive issue. They're really about treating it. They don't need two and a half, three days of testing. And you can imagine dominating a psychologist's schedule for three days is expensive. Yeah. And so in a clinical setting, there's not a huge use for it. It's really the neuropsych testing is used to prove stuff, to prove how injured somebody is. And that mostly comes up in our context. So it can be an unpleasant experience uh, going through that for a client, but it is provable. And it's all about you know, trying to maximize uh, and to make sure that our clients are getting compensated from the insurance companies. And when they're not willing to recognize it and we have to go to battle with them, you know, I have to explain to the client, well, look, you're going to have to go through this testing. It's going to be expensive, which, you know, we don't necessarily worry about as a cost, but it's going to be invasive. It's going to be unpleasant. It's also going to be two and a half days of your life, <laughs> right? Wow. So, um, a great question. Is that something the client pays for, this additional testing? That's a really great question. In, in our cases and at our firm, we advance the cost, um, which means we would pay for it. The law firm would advance that as a cost, but then we would get reimbursed from the settlement in addition to our fees. So we're contingency based. So we we'd get our percentage and we would get our cost of that testing because they're essentially going to be an expert. So we're retaining an expert and the expert then meets with our client, get, you know, does the testing and then provides us with a report. And then that person would also, you know, we also retain them to be willing to testify in a deposition and then be, and then also be willing to testify at trial. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so it's very helpful if they've had uh, already had a lot of medical records regarding their injury before they start the case. And then you guys will sometimes supplement that with your own recommended testing. Well, uh, yes. I mean, and it is helpful that they have a baseline. Uh, so if, they, if they've seen a counselor or a psychologist before, uh, some people would say, oh, well, that's bad because that shows that a prior injury. And not necessarily because then that psychologist will say, hey, I met with so-and-so. And this person is very high functioning and, and these are the issues that they're working with. And then after the accident, they meet with somebody or they meet with a neuropsychologist and it's like, oh, wait, that list is four times as long. And instead of working on two or three things, they're working on 10, you know, and instead of just struggling with, you know, the issues they're working on before. So, I mean, it can be helpful. Um, but yeah, in, in a mental injury case, uh, we, we definitely are going to have to supplement for the evidence. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for answering my question. And I think that covers it. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say around this topic? Uh, yeah, there is just one thing in closing. Uh, you know, we always, it takes a lot of courage for people to be willing to go through the fight sometimes. And it also can say it can be demoralizing and it can be really lonely because people feel like they're getting put through the ringer. 
and they feel like people are trying to discredit them. And that's because they are. The mm-hmm. insurance company is trying to discredit them and say, we don't believe you. We think you're making this up. We think you're doing this for money. I've seen that in a report from, a, uh, from an insurance company neuropsychologist. Oh, this person's motivated by money. And it's wow. discouraging. Uh, so if somebody sees this and they're wondering, well, hey, what do I do? Where should I keep going? I, I mean, I, I would say you, you have to keep going to get the justice and to recover the damages that you've suffered. I mean, it's going to be difficult. And I try and be a resource for clients who are going through that, but it's difficult because it's not me. You know, I'm not, I'm not having those issues. So I can't say, oh, I know just what that's like. Cause I don't. Yeah. Um, so. So aside from an attorney, you kind of have to help coach them a bit like, Hey, this, you're going to have to dig deep and find some strength because this is known to be a difficult process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Will. All right. That wraps it up. Great. Take care. Bye-bye.